All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. Thank you for coming out. This is the uh, first lecture in the new series entitled The Transvaluation of All Values. So a small subject should be easy to cover. Tonight's is uh, scarcity versus abundance. And I am Lazarus. I have returned from the dead. I have come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. T.S. Eliot. That's what we're here for. All of you, all of you know it. You feel it. You see it. You read it. Things are changing. Things are different. It's not the way it was. Books, magazine articles, everywhere you look. Like for, my favorite example is Zizek, Slavjo Zizek, uh, has a book called Living in the End Times. He's suddenly become a Christian millenarianist. <laughs> you know, something strange is happening when Slavjo Zizek has become a Christian millenarianist. Economic people say we're going to have a big economic collapse. We just had a really big economic collapse. They're like, no, 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 we're going to have a really big economic collapse. I'm like, no, that was a real, no, really big one. And, and like I said, I think we all feel it. And generally what we get is this is the end. This is the collapse. This is the catastrophe. It'll be a relief when it arrives because we're on the <laughs> precipice and we want to fall. It's the waiting that kills us. Uh, if history is anything to go by, this is wrong. History has not ended yet. The collapse generally does not come. So what's going on? Why do we feel this? Why is it so palpable, so common? What's happening, I would argue, and this is the subject and purpose of this series, is the world has changed and we have not. We are carrying this baggage from the past. Our values, I'll use that word, I'll talk about it in a second. And we're applying them in a world that is not from the past. And this unnerves us incredibly. And it gives us a sense of dis-ease. And it disrupts our capacity to think and reflect and to know what's going on. If you feel shock at things that are going on in the world, this simply means you've misunderstood the world. That's what the shock is. People, many people were shocked at the sudden outburst of, uh, of, of racism and, and white supremacy that, that came out after the election. These people are called white people. I don't think the African American community was that shocked. They were like, we've been trying to explain this shit to you guys for years. The world didn't actually change that much. But we're in this struggle between the values that we have, we've been taught, we've been raised with, we've internalized, and the world we inhabit. Hence the title, The Transvaluation of All Values. How do we get from what we feel, what we've internalized, to where the world is and the where the world's going? Um, Barza, the great thinker I always like to talk about, said you can live in a classical age. In a classical age, People agree about what you disagree about. You know what you're fighting over. The rules are established. The game is focused. It's not that people don't fight or disagree or argue. It's just that you know what you're arguing about. In a decadent age, you don't even agree on what you're fighting about. You don't share enough ground to have a shared arena for confrontation. This is the fragmentation of values. The values have become so fragmented, so complex, so differentiated that it throws us off. It creates tension. It creates dis-ease. 
And when you're shocked or scared or feel afraid at something new or different or strange that pops into your mind or experience, fear and shock keep you from thinking, which is, of course, what we need to do. But literally, those emotions, those feelings, those responses stop you thinking right when you need to think the most. And so instead of thinking about what's happening, you fall back on your internalized responses, your values. And so you can see you get this sort of ugly feedback cycle. The other thing that happens is times like these, and, and I'll, I'll point to Pinker. I always like to pick on Pinker because he's such an idiot. Um, but he has a book out called uh, um, Enlightenment Now, and he has all these charts and graphs that tell you how great the world is and how wrong you are for thinking the world is not great. By the way, this is just what they did with the five-year plans during the Soviet Union. Every five years, <laughs> they came out with charts and graphs that proved that you were living in a world worker's paradise. And if you were a worker and not feeling the paradise, something was wrong with you. And we had re-education camps available to help you sort of get with the program, to feel good about it again. Something like a little trip to the gulag to sort of raise your consciousness. Right? So, that, so when you have charts and graphs, it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to evidence. You should. The question is not that we're wrong. The question is, why is there a gap between the way we feel, what we experience, and how we see the world, and some of the evidence? This is the problem. Having a bunch of graphs and charts does not clear up that problem in any way. So that's what we want to explore. First, a loose definition of values. I'm using this loosely. We could say culture. Culture is sort of the shared values of a large community. Subculture is the shared value of a smaller community. And I think values are really the individual version of that. We're all part of cultures. We're all part of subcultures. And it boils down to our individual values. And in, and in the book Albion Seed, which is an interesting, great book in many ways, um, he uses the definition of this, he calls them folkways. I thought this is as good a way to look at it as any, because it is a subtle and complex thing. And this is the first picture there. He says it's habitual uses, manners, customs, mores, and morals. But it is habitual is the, is the really significant part. How we speak, how we think about our family, what do we think about marriages, sex, child rearing, age, death, religion, learning, food, dress. Social rank, order, power, freedom. It's all these core concepts. They vary dramatically from group to group to group, from area to area, but they're incredibly powerful and influential. And since we tend to imbibe these when we're children, they're really, really, and I mean really hard to change, to come to grips. They're even hard to examine. The, the psychological research on this is very clear that we have, most of the time we're just reacting to the world. We're, we're, our, our, our minds want to keep us sort of at a, at a stasis beings. Keep everything smooth, everything's running well, look at things that might need to pay attention to, otherwise everything is good. Stasis. We can do higher order thinking and reflect on the world critically with reason and rationalism. We tend not to like to do this. It's very energy consuming, and we tend to avoid it, but we can do it. It's one of the great human tricks. We're capable of doing it. We don't do it very much, but we can do it. But there's even a higher order or a different order specialized that allows humans to reflect on themselves. Now, this is incredibly powerful and almost never invoked. We don't like to do that. It unnerves us. Part of your brain will always fight you when you try to do this. Again, a lot of research to suggest you'll sneeze, you'll get distracted, you'll get sleepy, you'll get hungry, you get angry, it's a way of shutting it down. Emotions will well up, a way of shutting down the thinking. Anything not to actually have to look back and examine closely your own deep held core values and beliefs. So that's what we're gonna do in this lecture. We're gonna make ourselves really uncomfortable and uh, try and dig in deep. And by deep, I'll give you just a few examples of how this works. One is from history. We, we think of history as the things that happened, and the problem is history is the remembered past. It's not the past, the past is too vast for us to deal with. 
It's the remembered past. So what we choose to remember changes how we view the world. This is why people are always arguing about history. What you choose to remember and how you choose to remember it informs your present. And you go, well, this is history. Well, it's one, it's one way to remember history. So if you read history books, I was just trying to think of an abstract one that doesn't have a lot of weight for us. If you read history books about Spain, they say, well, the Moors conquered Spain. And then later the Spanish kicked them out. Now this is interesting because there was no Spain for the Moors to invade. <clears throat> Probably a better argument would say Spain was born from the act of kicking the Moors out. That process of organizing and fighting a common, common enemy was essentially the creation of Spain as a nation. Now, the, the physical location of the Iberian Peninsula existed, but there was nothing remotely like Spain. No organized, coherent series of languages or governments or anything. Hence, they were so easily conquered by the Moors. But if you're Spanish, what it does is it moves your history back about 500 years. We weren't born in the 1500s, we were born in the 1100s. We were already there when the Moors arrived. It's a neat trick. Not that important in some ways, important in other ways. America, American history begins in 1776, as long as you overlook the several thousand years of native civilizations that preceded that. Right? What do you mean by America and American? US history, maybe. But it's a curious way to write your history. But again, there, you know, it's, there's the facts of it and then how you deal with it. So even if something is, is seemingly concrete as history, how you remember it matters. Um, and what's important here is that what values do, they don't tell you what the world is, they tell you what the world means. What does it mean to be Spain? It, your values tell you that not Spanish history. When you hear Spanish history, you read that through the lens of your values. So people are always excited about some new invention, some new technology, some new this or that. The only real question is, how is that new thing interpreted by the shared values, your values or the shared values of your culture? That's what determines its meaning, its use, its implementation. We always miss this. So when the train was invented, people said, oh, that's an iron horse. It's nothing like an iron horse, but this was all their experience and values and background allowed them to recognize. And so, iron horse. It took a long time to learn that it was not an iron horse. A long, long time, actually. How incredibly strong is this? The example that springs to mind, I'm going to use a lot of contemporary examples, which I've tended to avoid before, because I think just to sort of keep us right on point. Um, so the Catholic Church has been found guilty of systematic child rape over decades by thousands of individuals who have been promoted and protected by the church and have inflicted their suffering on tens of thousands of children. And yet, this does not seem to affect the Catholic Church very much at all. How many children do you have to rape before people go, this institution has a problem? It turns out it's an infinite number. Who would have predicted that? Thousands over generations. Protected, no ramifications. Ah, but if you interpret this as, oh, that's an aberration, a few bad apples, things happen, there's bigger issues at stake then your values take something that would, you would think would be pretty obviously not good, that needs serious addressing, if not absolute elimination, and says, well, you know. That is the incredible power of value. We can do that with anything. And to not do that is difficult. We, it, it, it's, it's basically, you have to do things like break with your church, which is, which is a huge lift. It's not a small thing, it's a big thing. Two more examples from brilliant people. Uh, both Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein faced a similar intellectual problem. They developed systems, mathematical and physical, 
whose outcomes questioned core beliefs. Bertrand Russell wanted to prove that mathematical certainty was absolute. Albert Einstein was looking for the perfect rules for the universe. Neither of them were strongly religious people. Russell was famously uh, aggressively non-religious. But his generation, the values he was raised in, had a God-shaped space. He took the God out, but there was still a God-shaped space there. And Russell and Einstein tried to fill it with mathematics and physics. And when both those projects succeeded incredibly in every other measure, some of the most important logic and mathematical work ever done was done by Bertrand Russell. Alfred North Whitehead. Einstein, of course, famously wrote, but both of them dead in their tracks. When Russell was convinced that you couldn't prove absolute perfect mathematical certainty, he just stopped. He just fell apart. He himself said this. Einstein spent the second half of his life arguing against the, the outcomes of the first half of his life. <laughs> the, the famous phrase is that God does not play dice with the universe. All of the evidence suggests that, they, 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 hey, there is no God, and if there was, he was, in fact, playing statistical games with the universe. And Einstein fought and fought and fought and fought against this because he so desperately, desperately wanted the world to be orderly and perfect and godlike, without a god, but with that god-shaped space in there. And, and, both, and you look at their work. And so it's, just, it's not just random people, it's brilliant people. This is, this is in part, particularly perhaps an insoluble problem. All we can do is work on it. Final example, more trivial, but one I like is right now today, think of a big city like Manhattan. Somebody today is moving into their apartment in Manhattan for the first day. They are excited. Just moved to the big city, Manhattan, Big Apple. Woo, life is great. Someone next door, a floor above, a floor below, has been living in Manhattan for 20 years, has forgotten they live in Manhattan. They're just going about their lives. They're not aware that they live in Manhattan. Somebody else is moving out of the city going, I, oh, I am so sick of this stinking chamber of iniquity and lines and noise, and I hate it. This is the exact same place. The, the city has not changed. These people are all inhabiting, in theory, the same place. Ah, their values, their experiences, they interpret it incredibly differently. That's the, again, this is the power of values. I'll keep coming back to this. So the first value I want to look at. So what I want to do for the rest of the series, having done that brief introduction, is look at core values that we all hold, where they came from, why we hold them, how wrong they are, and the kind of values we should adopt going forward. <laughs> and I don't mean to say your core values are wrong, but they are. Um, so, but, it, but uh, with the caveat that it's not entirely your fault. Uh, we're, they're, they're just, they train us up. And they don't even mean to, but they do. But now we, it's, it's our job to untrain ourselves to the, the best extent that we can. So the first one I want to start with is scarcity versus abundance. We are told, have been told, will be told, we are trained, we live in a world of scarcity. That there's absolutely, totally, 100% not true. But this is what we believe, how we act, and how we behave. Why do we believe we live in a world of scarcity? Well, if you look at the chart on the back, in 1820, and there's all kinds of versions of this, Somewhere around 90% of the world's population lived in dire, extreme poverty and were subject to endemic recurrent starvation. 90% of the world's population. This is not a long time ago, 1820. Just over 180 years, 200 years. 90% of the world's population. And it had been this way for at least 10,000 years. The history of civilization is the history of people repeatedly starving to death. All of our sources indicate this clearly. You make the agricultural leap, great. The problem with agricultural leap is when the crop doesn't come in, there's no food. 
It's a little tiny hole in the project. And when there's no food, not a few people starve, just about everybody starves. Well, 90% in 1820. This is an astonishing number. Clothes throughout world history, incredibly scarce. We take clothes for granted. We give clothes away, clothes at goodwill, clothes in the free box, clothes on the street. We leave clothes places. That is crazy, ladies and gentlemen. In the history of the world, people have never left clothes behind for the same reason that we don't leave thousands of dollars of cash behind by accident. Oh, I left a gold bar sitting at that restaurant. No, we don't do that. Because to us, clothes are just pff, nothing. People were generally naked or underclothed. I always like to, if you go to the paintings of Bruegel or the Dutch masters, it's winter time. People are out ice skating and they're wearing almost nothing. They often just walked around barefoot in the snow because they didn't have shoes. Shoes, shoes were like the luxury item. If you had shoes, man, you had made it. So perfectly reasonably, for the last, oh, 10,000 years or so, we developed a value system that material goods were scarce because material goods were scarce. It wasn't a trick, it wasn't a lie. It wasn't the rich taking everything from the poor, although they were happy to do that. They just didn't exist. And so we've been trained in. This is what we learned. We learned this over millennia. And then roughly 1820, industrial revolution, agricultural revolution, technological changes, communication, mobility, the capacity to ship things, engineering, woo, boom. Today, the world population is reversed. Probably about 10% of the world's population live in poverty, dire poverty. And almost all of that, not all, almost all of that is due to civil strife. Syria is a perfectly wealthy country that's busy chopping itself into pieces. So it's not a lack of material goods or resources. It's the, it's the decision or the failure to, to govern effectively. Most of the world's population that remains is, in fact, a governance issue, not a material goods issue. But for the developed world and the developing world, essentially, there is no material shortage of anything of any kind. And if whatever there is, if we wanted to, which we may not want to, but if we wanted to, we could happily produce it. But that change has happened in a few generations, in a few lifetimes. And so our value system has not had any time whatsoever to adjust, really, to the notion that we don't have scarcity, we have plenty. Our problems are not shortage, our problems are superabundance. So let me give you a few examples. Um, so so with the, I'll use Apple repeatedly through this, just because I think they're so fun to pick on. Um, Historically, one of the things that's been really scarce is capital and money, cash. Uh, wars were fought. In the Netherlands and England did well for generations fighting wars, famously against Napoleon, but also against others, because they just had better banking systems. Not radically better banking systems, but just better enough that they had more capital. They could spend more. They could keep more men in the field. They could loan more money. They could pay more mercenaries. This is very helpful in a world where cash is short. So our whole economic system is maximize capital returns so that you can make money, then you invest that, grows the economy, you harvest more capital returns, everybody's a winner. Yay. Well, one hole that we now have in this problem, or in this system, besides some of the other ones people are probably more familiar with, is that what do you do when you've made all the money and you have nothing to do with it? Right now, Apple is sitting on, no one knows exactly how much because the reporting is very hazy, but somewhere between 300 and $500 billion in cash, liquid assets, overseas. They have a, over a trillion dollars in market capitalization, which means they could borrow anytime they wanted another five or $600 billion at very low interest rates. So tomorrow, if Apple saw something shiny and nice that they really wanted for a trillion dollars, it could buy it. 
say, you know, I don't know, the Sudan or <laughs> Mars, right? I mean, what the hell do you do with a trillion dollars? The answer, nobody knows. Apple has no idea what to do with the money. That's why it's sitting out there. It is the equivalent of shoving it under the bed. They've dug a hole in the backyard and they keep throwing money into it because they don't know what to do with it, literally. And they just announced they had their most profitable quarter ever. Ladies and gentlemen, this is insane. We have $500 billion. We don't know what to do with it. We have another $500 billion we could borrow that we're not going to touch because we have no idea what to do with it. But by the way, we just made our most profitable ever quarter, $11 billion more in cash. Woo! Why? We don't know. Because we don't know what to do with it. But the logic of scarcity says you have to make more money. Maximize your return. Because it's scarce. It's not scarce. When you have $500 billion in cash, cash is not scarce. Simultaneously, they have workers committing suicide in factories in Asia because they work them so hard to squeeze a few more dollars out. This is, this is truly madness. It's a complete misfit of values. It's scarce. Maximize return. Save that money so you can... In what? We have nothing to do with it. So they're just finishing their big Apple campus, and they're like, woo, we spent like $4 billion on it. That sounds like a lot of money. It's not. It is the most ridiculously, embarrassingly tiny amount of money. It is, it is the values of people who think things are scarce. It's very small spending. The equivalent of Versailles, by the way, Louis XIV was not a spendthrift king. He gets a lot of bad rap for that. He was actually fairly reasonable with the, with the French budget. And he spent anywhere between 1% and 6% a year on fixing up Versailles. He did this for about 30 years. Apple would need to spend about $4 billion a year, every year, for the next 30 years to have the equivalent of what Louis XIV spent on Versailles. Vers but Louis XIV did not have the scarcity mindset. He had a plenty mindset, because he was Louis XIV. Apple, with titanically more resources and just cash piled up to the sky, has a starvation scarcity mentality, and so they built the equivalent of a cardboard shack relative to their money income because they just don't understand. Their values are completely misfit. And it's driving them mad, by the way. They, they keep asking them, what are you going to do with the money? And they're like, uh. And the reason they don't invest it, by the way, is because they're afraid of losing it. This is, when you have $500 billion and you won't spend it because you're afraid of losing money? So you see, that fear is not grounded in reality. That fear is grounded in 10,000 years of endemic starvation. They're not going to go bankrupt. I mean, they would have to make a series of titanically bad investments to even blow like 5% of their cash. I mean, they would just have to all get drunk and go to Vegas. I mean, you can buy a lot of hookers and blow with that kind of money, right? I mean, the hangover is going to be bad, but you're going to have, I mean, it's just impossible. To, you can't burn through it. You can't. But they won't. They won't. They, and they're just, they're frozen. So they keep announcing record returns. They have no idea what to do with it. So they just keep, but it's, it's, this is the values problem. It's abundance that's our problem. Um, food is another one that keeps coming up uh, because people get, oh, people starve to death. It's true people starve to death, not from lack of food. People starve to death for all kinds of other reasons. We're, the world is super abundant with food. Uh, like, by the way, ethanol. When you fill your gas tank and it says 10% ethanol, you're just pumping food into your car. Now, we, we may like putting food into our cars, but if we wanted to feed more people, we could. But we've just said, no, we would rather put food in our cars. It's just corn. Right? Ethanol is just corn. So feed people or no feed your car. 
<laughs> We've chosen the car, which is fine. Avocados. I like avocados. We grow avocados. This is a stupid crop. If you want to feed people, you don't grow avocados. But we're not care about feeding people. We like to eat avocados. We have unbelievable abundance cornucopia of this rich food from all over the world that we get to eat. Why? Because there's way too much food. We have way too much food. We have a super abundance of food. So we just do stupid stuff with it. Which I'm all in favor of, by the way. But it's just, it's just not a shortage. A shortage is not the distribution, maybe. Mostly people starve because of regional political instability, again. It's a shortage of good politics, not a shortage of any kind of material goods. And then I was thinking, OK, maybe the environment. But even if you look at the environment, which we've done a pretty good job of messing up, pretty much all the resources are, are, are if they are short or scarce, it's a waste issue, not an abundance issue. We're ref the f we've actually sort of maybe turned the corner. We're adding more forest land per year to the world than we're subtracting. But of course, these will be young trees and take a while to reach the biomass. But it is quite possible, and there is historical examples like Japan, which used to be widely deforested and now is the most, uh, is like 80% forest cover. They reforested their country. It is possible. We can do this if we want to. You know, so it, it, it's, it's, but it really is, it's pretty hard to put a finger on something that's scarce. But abundant or overabundant, that is no problem. To make it more personal, more real, have you ever been to Costco? <laughs> Holy shit. So here's what's happened. We've taken the scarcity model of material goods, which used to be scarce, not scarce anymore. But we've written it onto everything, even non-material goods that cannot experience scarcity. My favorite example is beauty. We're always being told that beauty is scarce, the 10 most beautiful places to visit. There aren't 10 most beautiful places. There's a million trillion incredibly lovely moments for you to experience in the world. There's an infinite supply of beauty for anyone with eyes to behold. And yet they're always telling us, no, it's scarce, it's rare, you have to go there to find beauty. It's only here. Oh, it's not over there. The five most beautiful women in the world. What the hell does that mean? Every other woman in the world is ugly? No. There's an infinite number of beautiful people in the world. There's no, it's an endless supply. But our scarcity model that we took from a materially scarce world, we wrote on everything. And so you roll into Costco. It's just horrifying. <laughs> the parking lot is horrible. I don't understand why parking lots have to be ugly, but apparently it's, it's a physical law of the universe. And then you go inside, and there's a lot of stuff, and it's all big. And that appeals to us because we know things are scarce. And so we feel the abundance, and it makes us feel good. Look at all of the riches that are here. And I should get them now before they're gone. <laughs> See? Because that's where 10,000 years of training. You'd better get it now. I mean, sure, you might not need 800 pounds of black beans, but <laughs> it's cheap. And you know money is scarce. Money is not scarce, but you know it is scarce. And there's a lot of it, and you might want a lot of it. You don't need it, it's not going away, but get it now. And the whole place is ugly. So if everything else were the same, but it was beautifully packaged, beautifully presented, there would be this lovely experience. Ah, but no, we're not there for that because it's a scarce, scary, de deprivation-ridden world that we inhabit. We're not there for beauty, we're there to fill our need for abundance. I need to feel the abundance. I need to grab, I need to grip onto it. The problem with abundance is you can't grip onto it. As soon as you do this, you don't have abundance. The grasping hand is never full, right? It's, it's true. That's, that you can't grab abundance because you're grabbing it with a fear-ridden, needy, greedy heart, which is, of course, prevents all abundance from occurring. Best band. Most beautiful piece of classical music. Again, there's no limit. We have access in our world 
to music of superabundance. I mean, what a joy, what a pleasure. But what do they tell us? You're listening to the wrong music. You're not listening to the good music. You need to listen to the right composer. You need to read right, you know. What the hell are you talking about? This is joy and beauty and opportunity. But, ooh, again, grasping narrow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's this weird, weird tension. Do you see that between the material constraints, which no longer exist, really? But then they get overwritten to all the other non-material things. And so we think there's a lack of, of, of these opportunities and, and experiences and beauty and joy and, and, and love and people that there can't be. It's in, literally impossible because it's in you. You see the world beautifully. Oscar Wilde writes about this. You, you, you make the world beautiful because of you. You see the beauty in it. You bring the beauty to it. So the, the only lack can be in you. It's not a material lack. But none of this, by the way, would be a problem if we all agreed on it. This is the incredible thing with values. It only becomes a problem when we begin to feel, as I suspect we may be feeling, that something has gone awry. And so now we're getting all these responses to it. So one of the ones you can look at is something like the tiny house movement. The tiny house movement is, is to say, oh, I don't really need to live in this gigantic, ginormous house, which is like, great, that's fine. The implications of this are awe-inspiring, by the way. Because what it says is, more and bigger material goods will not make me happy, are not necessary. This is not a subtle break with our cultural traditions. It's an absolute abandonment of core features of our values. Because once you have a small house, you can't fill that thing with crap. Well, you can, but it just won't take you very long. <laughs> It's just, it's just what, because it's tiny. I don't need a 64 inch TV because my room's not 64 inches wide. I guess I could put it in diagonally. Right? And I'm not against big houses, actually. Do a beautiful big house, that's a great thing. Don't fill it with crap, that's what we do. Build ugly, hideous big houses and fill them with ugly, hideous crap. That's the problem. But if people begin to make this decision, I guess you're having a problem all over the country. The, the, the uh, I don't know what generation, the baby boomer generation and older are dying. And they have a lot of crap. And their kids and grandkids are like, no thanks. We, don't, we just don't want all that stuff. Ooh. By the way, 80% of our economy is consumer goods. If people stop going consuming like that, it, it's going to be different. Nobody knows what it's going to be. It's going to be different. A large percentage, some put the estimate as high as like 30% of, of people under 30 do not have a driver's license. It is hard to sell a car to someone who does not have a driver's license. The car companies are starting to freak out just a little bit. Because that iconic American material good has suddenly and rapidly for an upcoming generation vanished. They're like, eh, car, don't want one, not getting a license. Eh, there you go. That's like, what? No, this is the, right? We all know this, the car. It's not just your car, it's your freedom. One of my favorite advertising slogans of all time. The complete confusion of material goods with a non-material good. We do this all the time. So what's happening is our, what, what, what Kenneth Clark called our heroic materialism, right? This just absolute titanic, unbelievable, powerful belief in materiality and material goods is breaking down. That's what bothers us. It's not the craziness of materialism. In fact, you can critique that all the time. But our values are cotton to hit these tensions, environmental notions. Well, maybe it isn't good for the environment if I consume in a particular way. Hey, wait a second. You're supposed to be interested in the material good, not the arc of it. Or maybe it's just, too, I want something small. I want something made by blind Portuguese children because I like them. Okay. Wait, no, no, but that's, you're looking at some other aspect that's not the material good, not the size of it, something else. This begins to throw things off. It begins to cause dis-ease in us. 
Because our value that says that's the material good, now these other, is fragmenting. That's what we don't like. Back again, if everybody agrees on the value, then we can argue about it. And that doesn't bother us at all. We like that. It's when it starts to break down and some people go, eh, I just don't believe in that. I just don't believe in materialism. And enough people that it starts to affect things. And we're like, hey, wait a second. So people say, oh, it's crazy to pay this much for you know, coconut cream that was harvested by you know, sea nymphs from an island off the coast of Atlantis. And they go, you shouldn't do that. It's like, why? You can get coconut cream like that that's the same that wasn't harvested by sea nymphs for one-tenth the cost. You're like, ah, that's not my material value. I don't see the money as scarce. I see sea nymph jobs as scarce. <laughs> And so I'm willing to pay extra for a non-material good. Oh, this is challenging. It creates all kinds of moral conundrums, which you must have felt. Well, should I buy the organic beef? Should I buy the organic free-range beef? Should I buy the lab-grown, genetically modified beef? Should I buy the tofu beef? You know, and you start going, wait, so you have these, right, people have these, at the store, right? Now you have moral conundrums at the store. You used to not have moral conundrums at the store. <laughs> now you do, because our values are switching. They're changing, it's moving, and it drives us crazy, by the way. It makes us a little crazy, it threatens us. But the only thing we can do is begin to examine um, internally this fundamental notion of is the world full of scarcity or is it full of abundance? Materially speaking, it's absolutely full of abundance. You just can't argue this. But oh, our values, we still struggle with that. In fact, our problems are not scarcity. Our problems are the problems of abundance. So just uh, one example is our road. They keep writing about how our roads are not well maintained. Bridges collapse. That's always fun. Um, you know, the train systems in disarray. Why? It's because we have too damn many roads to maintain. This is why. We have a lot of roads. We have a super abundance of roads. And so our answer to this is to, one, build more roads. Because we know the answer to any problem is more of that problem. <laughs> right? I mean, what else could you possibly do? And so we're starting to hit this like material wall where there's no way you're like, you're looking at, well, how, can we maintain all the roads we have? Probably not. Do we still want to build new roads? Yes. Again, this is not a scarcity issue. This is like the drunk rich Duke issue. You have 400 racing horses. Yes, they're dying of lack of food. Yes, where are you going? I'm going to buy some racing horses. <laughs> this is a classic move, by the way. This has been done historically. Um, but it's, it's, it's not really wise. Um, other problems, again, of course, the food problem. We have all these obesity issues. We have you know, all that, that kind of crazy stuff going on. This is from abundance, superabundance, baffling with choices. Um, uh, again, anytime you're, look, Amazon, people have gone on Amazon, it's like they're just killing you with choice. Just say, give, just point to one. I want one thing. I just want one crappy thing. I want an apple peeler. I don't want a hundred choices. It's too many. It freezes people with choice. What do you listen to if you can listen to every song that's ever been recorded? I think I'll just listen to the same song I did yesterday because I'm just frozen with opportunity. It's too much. Super abundance. What should I read? How do I choose books? I can read any book. All millions, access, on my doorstep, two days. Ah, what should I read? Notice this becomes a moral choice. Oh, I should read good things. Well, how do I decide what's good? Oh, and crap. You know, it, 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 those, are, those are our struggles. So we need new values. And here's some values I want us to start thinking about. Uh, one, we need to start thinking about eliminate, not add. Whatever the problem is, generally we think, let's add. My house is too small, let's add a room. Or, let's get rid of some shit. Okay, if you've had a couple more kids, add a room, knock yourself out. Oh, get rid of some kids, but probably add a room. Adding a room, totally sensible. 
right? But potentially, just possibly, just maybe, it's a vast collection of crap that seems to accumulate around us no matter what we do in this world that is causing our problem, not a lack of space. Because every statistic suggests that we live in incredibly large houses relative to any historical standard. And we think, well, I've got three garages. If I just added another garage and an off-site storage and another room, I would be there. Right? This is the, the, you see this everywhere. I mean, all the statistics show this, that the off-site storage is just booming in the country. People add rooms, add garages to three garage houses, add garages to, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's an infinite or. You can ask, what can I get rid of? Just try it as an experiment. The next time you have a problem, you're faced with something. Instead of thinking add, order, supplement, increase, just ask yourself, OK, that's all possible. And maybe it's good. And maybe it's the right answer. I'm not saying this is an absolute. I'm just saying it's our knee-jerk reaction. And then you can turn around and say, well, or what could I eliminate? What could I get rid of? What could I subtract? What could I use less of? It's always good to ask, what could I use less of in my life, in my world, in my environment? We almost never ask this, by the way. By the way, advertising and marketing is not real keen on this concept. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, my favorite example is Real Simple Magazine. If everybody has ever seen this, always read it. If you're checking out the grocery store, read it then. You never buy this magazine, but read it then. Because it always says something like, 110 common simplifying facial washes. <laughs> and I'm like, that doesn't sound simple at all. That sounds sort of unsimple. Sounds like I've made my life more complicated. You know, um, so, so second, people, not things. This is not a crazy radical idea, and yet, people, not things. If you looked around, and just say, it took half your stuff, so I, I could sell it back and get my cash back, so I could get ten or twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollars. How could I spend that on people? Visiting them, having them visit you, throw a big party. Just throw a titanically, like a $50,000 party. Why not? Well, that's a waste. You just wasted your money on people and joy. Well, that's stupid. We know that's wasteful. You could have bought something that you store and dust, oil, and maintain. That's so much better. Right? We know that. But we, 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 you know, we, we think about this as, as you know, the, the material good is going to be better. The, 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 uh, the thing is going to be better. Not the people. Actually, I, just, I think we've almost lost that concept of really investing your time and energy and space and resources in people. Not that you're going to get anything back from them other than the joy of their company and their thriving. But all our behaviors show this, by the way, as culturally, maybe not individually, but culturally, we absolutely do not do this. This is why they keep saying, you know, again, favorite example is with moms. You know, a mother is a real job. If she were paid for the work she did, because it's a huge imposition to have children and raise them and love them and spend time with them. This is horrible. And it's always how bad it is to be parents, how time can... What the hell are you talking about? It's the greatest thing ever. I mean, it's not materially rewarding. It's a time suck. But people, what's more important? Well, everything, apparently. Right? We know this. Culturally, we've decided this, absolutely. Um, health, vitality. This is, this is one where, where you, know, you can look in any number of ways, but if you feel lack, if you feel threatened, you want to sacrifice your health to, in the short term, this is just a mindset thing, by the way. It's, it's like almost genetic, it's like biological. I'll, I'll sacrifice myself now for a long-term protection, for a long-term good. I'll suffer at this job now 
or I'll, I'll, I'll endure this painful, unpleasant thing that damages my vitality because I'm building safeguards. I'm, I'm putting more Costco beans in my basement. <laughs> right? Somehow I'm doing something that makes me feel like I'm not going to starve to death. You're not going to starve to death, by the way. It's highly unlikely. But maybe, maybe that fear is still there because it was written in for 10,000 years. Hard to just write that out. Hard to really understand that you're not going to starve to death. One way to think about this is homeless people don't starve to death. That's impressive. This is not the historical norm. We have a lot of homeless people. I'm going to talk about that in a later lecture. And it's a problem, but it's probably not the kind of problem you're thinking of. But we're so rich, we have so much food and so much clothing that our homeless people just don't die in the streets. Historically, completely anomalous. And yet we fear it. Oh. So if, if we create these narratives, if everything goes wrong, if, if you lived through Y2K, People kept trying to tell you <laughs> that, like, the grocery stores were going to shut down, the registers wouldn't work, and there'd be no, and the trucks couldn't deliver food, and like the tractors wouldn't run on the. It was nuts. It was crazy. And yet, people, that, why? Because it appealed to that very base fear of scarcity. We know the world really is scarce. And that all this material wealth is chimerical. It's a, it's, 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 it's a phantasm. It's going to go away. It's going to vanish. Boom, just like that. And then we're going to be back to the world of scarcity and cold and hunger that we know is really there, just, just right there. And as long as you believe that, well, you just live a fear-based, terrified, scared, small mouse-like piglet life. Right? That's the, it, there's, and then, that, it, and there's nothing you can do in the world to convince somebody that that's not the case if that's how they feel. The only way you can address that is inside. You can't address that fear from the outside. How much wealthier could we be? What possible increase in material goods could there possibly be? Last note on this, and so what this leaves us with is, is for, for instance, the poverty rate in the United States is about 14%-ish, give or take. It's been about 14% for the last 50 years, 60 years. Hasn't moved one way or the other. Um, and this completely befuddles us because we're fabulously richer than we were 40, 50 years ago. And the poverty rate, just the same. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one reason it's not is from lack of material resources. This is our problem. We've been so starved, so traumatized by this theory of lack of material resources that when we see people suffering, we think they must lack some material resources. So let's give them some, and then they won't be poor. And it turns out that works until about 14%. At the 14% level, you hit, apparently, the problem is not material. And, and that's where we are. That's where we've been for quite a while, by the way. And, and it, 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 interestingly, this is pretty much standard throughout the developed world. All over Europe, France, the Netherlands, Germany, they have about the same poverty rate that we do. And it turns out that material wealth is good. It's good not to starve. It's good not to freeze in the wintertime. Up to a point. And once you've addressed all those material-based problems, you're thrown on a whole different set of problems that we have just not begun to deal with. And we keep throwing material goods at it. And it fails. And we're going to look, again, next couple of lectures of why that is, what those values are that need to change. But for tonight, I just want you to focus on, on what we talked about here. You do not live in a materially scarce world. You live in a world of super material abundance, unlike anything imaginable even 100 years ago. If you do not feel that way, 
you're just wrong. Really, truly. You're, you've misinterpreted the world. I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, and you need to think about why you feel that way and might see the world that way. And, and, but don't believe me again. Just look at any kind of reasonable measure of anything. And the scarcity, by the way, is only decreasing. I want to leave you with a couple of points to, to think about. This is not getting better in the sense of we're getting less materially rich, if that makes any sense. It's getting worse in the sense that we're getting more materially rich. We've broken the energy GDP barrier. So for almost all of human history, more GDP, more goods produced, more food, equaled more energy input. This is why you had slaves and peasants and serfs for so long. They were the energy input. The more of them you had, the more stuff you could make. Then we got steam and river power, and there was this jump. Then we got coal and oil, oil, whoo, electricity, this is some good shit. And GDP jumped, but energy consumption tracked it almost perfectly. And economists had argued for the longest time that this was just, you have to have more energy input to get more GDP. So you look at the world population, you look at energy growth, or uh, material goods growth, energy's gonna go, we're gonna run out of oil, we're gonna run out of coal, we're never gonna run out of coal, by the way, we got plenty of fucking coal. Um, you know, we're gonna have to dam all the rivers, you know, blah, 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 blah. A couple of years ago, about a decade ago, this started to break. GDP has been going up, energy consumption has been stable or going down. Our input of energy per GDP, it means that we can produce more stuff with less energy input. This is a titanic shift. As renewables come online, which they're doing very quickly, as manufacturing technology increases, which is doing very rapidly, that will only increase which means it's becoming cheaper and cheaper and easier and easier to produce more and more crap that we don't need anyway. <laughs> this is accelerating our problem of abundance. It's an astounding break. It's amazing. And it's also like, oh, no. Because we need some help. We need like a helpline to call with our stuff. But it's to see the abundance, to feel the abundance. Once you feel the abundance, then you don't need all the crap. Then you can let go of and go, well, if I want it, it'll be there. Right? I don't have to worry about abundance. Abundance is just falling on me. And then you can invoke other values. You can look to other things. You can, you, it will just change fundamentally your relationship to the material world. And again, it will begin to remove that veil that we've overwritten non-material goods on. That beauty is somehow short. That beautiful places are somehow short and scarce. That good things are limited, even things that aren't material. There's only so many excellent experiences. Oh, if you'd only been there 10 years ago when it was excellent, well, now it's, now it's not, right? It's this, this notion that it's all limited in time, no. More access to better, more beautiful than ever before, but, we, but we're not feeling it, which is the weird thing. And it's because of this 10,000 years of training. So, so I'm going to give you, like I said, I'm going to give you little homework assignments in this series. Make it a little different. Um, so try and pay attention to this. Look, when you feel lack or feel threatened or feel unnerved, feel that it's not abundant, just stop and say, is this true? Is this right? Is this correct? How could I check? What could I, what, how can I just, uh... You know, just try and be aware because, I mean, it's very hard to undo 10,000 years of cultural training, particularly in the relatively short transition from 1820 to today. But many of the problems that we face, and we do face real problems, by the way, they just can't be solved with material abundance. Those are the problems that we have left now. But they take a totally different value system to address. And, that, and that's what we have to try and develop. And that's what we're going to focus on. So transvaluation of all values, the new values we need for the world we inhabit and the world we're going to live in. Thank you very much.